The investigating officers called them the most awful and disturbing crimes they'd ever investigated. They became known as the Night Stalker Attacks, a series of rapes, sexual assaults and burglaries at night on the elderly. Most were in their 70s and 80s. But despite 53-year-old Delroy Grant being found guilty today, the Metropolitan Police had to apologise for missing an opportunity to catch him in 1999 when his car was spotted at the scene of a burglary. He committed hundreds of offences after that error, with 128 victims in all, before finally being arrested ten years later. Our Home Affairs correspondent, Simon Israel, has this special report. This is Delroy Grant unmasked. For 18 years, this man terrified an elderly population which spanned the outskirts of South London. He became known as the Night Stalker, prowling the streets, hidden from view, searching for victims in their own homes. A marathon police operation which began in 1998 took 11 years to find him. But on the way, there were missed opportunities, basic police errors, which allowed Grant to roam these streets and to claim dozens more victims. It is appropriate for the Metropolitan Police to apologise now for this missed opportunity that led to his continued offending for so long afterwards. And indeed, I have done that this morning to the families and victims who are here. We are deeply sorry for the harm suffered by all those other victims and for our failure to bring justice, uh, to bring Grant to justice earlier. Grant presented a most unlikely profile for a serial rapist and a highly proficient burglar. In this quiet cul-de-sac, he was a full-time carer for his second wife, crippled by MS. He was the father of eight children, stepfather of four more, and a Jehovah's Witness with regular visits to this church in Forest Hill. Not a single neighbour had a bad word to say of him. No one would say, like, boy, he's one that you could really say, Delroy is a stalker, he's a wicked man, he's a bad man. He's just calm, quiet, cool, collective. So it's hard to believe. He is a dedicated uh, husband, father, uh, he's a Jehovah Witness. He's, he's such a nice guy. But beneath the benevolent exterior lay an altogether different persona. Grant's nighttime predatory life spread fear among thousands of elderly residents. He would survey their homes, sometimes from the dark corners of back gardens. He would remove entire windows, disable phone lines, dismantle fuse boxes, turn off electricity supplies and even unscrew light bulbs. For Delroy Grant was meticulous and left little to chance. He was very methodical, very determined um, once he selected his victim and would spend considerable time. Um, I can remember going to one, of, one um, venue where, where he spent what the scientists record must have been nearly an hour trying to pick out the lock out of, a, out of a door. Victims talked of having a torch shone in their faces. In conversation, Grant would taunt some of them for hours. While resistance may have scared him, submission he saw as an invitation to attack. Grab me by the shoulders and dragged me over to the settee and pushed me onto it. He grabbed one of my legs in each of his hands and yanked me to the front of the settee. He then raped me. This is the real voice of another of Grant's victims in a desperate 999 phone call. She was one of hundreds aged between 68 and 93 years old who Grant preyed upon. Grant is, according to some experts, a rare example of a gerontophile, someone seeking sexual vengeance and control over elderly people. They literally are treating their victims as objects. They don't see them as uh, human beings. They don't have that sort of normal sensitivity. Today, there were guilty verdicts on three rapes, seven indecent assaults and 16 burglaries. These 29 offences took place over 17 years, from 1992 until 2009, in towns on the outskirts of South London. But that's a fraction of what he's suspected of inflicting on the elderly communities here. Police believe there may be close to 200 victims, mostly from burglaries, but also rapes and sexual assaults. And there lies the sting in the tail for the investigators. For in May 1999, police missed two opportunities to place Grant at the top of their suspects list. One 
was a mix-up over DNA. The other was a visit by an officer to Grant's home behind me, now boarded up, to check if he was the owner of a car seen speeding away from a burglary. Grant's wife produced a registration document which confirmed that he was, but as a result, nothing was done. Grant's DNA had been recovered from the scene of his first rape back in 1992. The forensic laboratories were seeing the same DNA profile again and again in the coming years, and the same forensic scientist analysed Grant's DNA on more than a dozen occasions. But he was not on the database, so there was no one to match it with. We had his profile from, from the beginning, so if, the, if somebody had brought the suspect to us uh, a long while ago, we would have uh, matched him and um, that would have stopped it there and then. Um, but he seems to have been quite clever in evading the police. So uh, the, the case went on and uh, I never thought I would see an end to it. I assumed I'd retire before we caught the guy. What delayed his capture was what the Independent Police Complaints Commission described today as basic police errors. Detectives blew an opportunity back in 1999 they had his DNA, they had Grant's car registration, but with no follow-up inquiries, the dots were not connected. So Grant carried on, claiming probably another 146 victims. A massive police surveillance operation was mounted in 2009. From this grainy picture, detectives identified Grant's car. And then, Grant himself was spotted, leaving a cash machine he had used with a card taken from one of his victims.